Welcome to the Drama Teacher Podcast, brought to you by Theater Folk, the Drama Teacher Resource Company. I'm Lindsay Price. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. This is episode 188, and you can find any links to this episode in the show notes, which are at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 188. Okay, so today, today we're talking creative thinking and collaboration in a fabulous application. See, I'm, you, can you tell I'm smiling? I think this is such a great idea. So I'm a big fan of play festivals, fringe festivals, spent six years on the uh, fringe festival circuit, 24 hour play festivals, plays that happen within limitations, plays that have to happen in a time limit. It's exciting. There's tons of adrenaline. It's all flowing. And anyone that I've been involved with has been uh, such a fun, uh, creative experience. So when one of theater folk's great playwrights, Wendy Marie Martin, tells me that not only did she create a festival, but that it is a international festival that happens around the world, hence the term international, but it's over 24 hours from casting to closing curtain in all these places all over the world. Well, you have to color me intrigued. See, and then I say that stuff like that and I go, what is the color for intrigue, right? That's a, that's a question that could keep me up for hours. You know, is it red? Is it purple? Uh, okay. Okay. This is a rabbit hole. I do not need to vol- involve any of you in. So, How does the idea of being involved in an international 10-minute play festival sound, and you don't even have to leave your backyard? I know, it sounds intriguing, right? Well, it's intriguing to me. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. I am happy to be talking to Wendy Marie Martin today. Hello, Wendy Marie. Hello. Now, um, we here in uh, Theatre Folk Global Headquarters, we know Wendy Marie because she has a lovely play uh, in our catalog called Breathless. So uh, you all need to go and get that, right? We need to get that up front, I think. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, 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 Wendy Marie is part of a, a really interesting project that I wanted to share with all of you. But also, there are some interesting things going on in uh, in Wendy Marie's back room, which are also going to be of interest to you. And I, uh, so I was just looking at your bio before we, uh, we started rolling. And uh, the first thing that hits my eye is that you have a, uh, a BFA in acting, but an MFA in playwriting. Yes. So what was your, uh, so it sounds like your instinct in high school and coming out of high school was acting and somewhere that switched. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I I um I was lucky enough to have a high school drama teacher, Billy Houck, who I Are you kidding? Is one of your writers. No. Oh my gosh. Sorry. That was yeah, like He's t- the one that said told me to submit actually to you. Do you know? But I didn't know that he was your your teacher. He was, and oh. he is a playwright, so he had us writing a lot of monologues and scenes in school <laughs> in addition to acting. That ah, oh, okay. So Oh my God, that's a, that's a lovely little uh, addition. I, <laughs> I did I did know that that he suggested you, but I'm pretty sure he never said he was your he was a student of yours. Okay, so yeah. okay, so but then when you went to um, college, what made you decide acting first? Yeah, I had a hard decision with that actually because I um, in high school uh, I, I directed probably as much as I acted. And so, um, but for some reason that wasn't actually an option. We did write, but I didn't really understand you could study playwriting as a thing at that time. So I, um, I went to high, uh, to college. I started in Chicago in a liberal arts program. I came back to California to do a two year conservatory intensive program. And then I went to New York to finish my BFA in, and in acting at Marymount because that's where all my credits went to get me out the quickest. (laughs) Right. And um, but I didn't do any acting in it. Ironically, I actually took playwriting classes while I was in New York. Isn't it? So, so that, that was your that was that was where the heart lied, right? Yeah, I think after two years of a, an intensive acting conservatory, I was just sort of clear that I don't need to be on stage. But what I really like to do is create stories. And when I'm writing, I'm I'm sort of acting 
and directing the thing at the same time, but it's just me in my room doing it. Um, so that I like that. <laughs> I have I have no idea what you're talking about. There's no, nobody talks to me in my head or anything. Right. <laughs> my husband often says that uh, sometimes he'll look at me and I'm literally I'm acting it out. Like I'm yep. just I'm having the com- both conversations, arms are flailing, and it's just uh, just that thing that happens. <laughs> exactly, our own little private theater, <laughs> <laughs> which you have to try and keep private. <laughs> it doesn't yes. work, it doesn't work so well when you're in public and you start having conversations with yourself. Um, okay. So I, I think that's, uh, but I, it, I think that's a really interesting thing to, to talk about because all of our, our listeners are, are, are dealing with um, students uh, who are just sort of uh, trying to figure out what they want to be. And a lot of them have that, oh, I want to go be an actor. Oh, I want to go be this. And I think it's really interesting that you started in one program, went to a conservatory, and then ended up in a different one. That that How did you, because uh, this is something that I have an issue with, what made it for you okay to to leave, you know what I mean? To let go of a program. Well, the, the, the first program for me, um, I, because we had a very, um, broad perspective, which I, which I really value in high school. Um, we had, we had to make our sets, we had to do directing, we had to do lighting design, we wrote, we acted. So we got a very broad education, but we didn't get a very specific education in acting. And at the liberal um, arts college where I attended, there was a feeder high school from Utah. And these kids were coming in knowing like every method of acting, knowing all these theories that I had no idea what they were talking about. And, um, and I realized at that point that I wanted to be able to, to be, you know, have a seat at the table and be in the room. And that was going to, for me, require a more intensive training. So I went to PCPA, which is at the Pacific Conservatory Theater in California, and and that's where I got my craft as an actor. But it's only a two-year certificate conservatory, so I was so close to having the degree, and I knew I wanted to teach. So I um, matriculated into Marymount and, and graduated from there with my BFA. Well, this leads me so nicely into my next question, which is um, you also talk about that you... Uh, you specifically work with uh, emerging artists, again, which I think is very, uh, it's a very interesting phrase because again, all our listeners, they're, they're working with emerging human beings, right? They're, uh-huh. Whether they're, whether they become artists or not, it's a very specific, um, it's a very specific task to be a teacher. And what was it about teaching for you? That you wanted, that you knew you wanted to do it. What was it about teaching? You know, I get, such a thrill out of watching like somebody's eyes light up and getting and getting in touch with what excites them just about life and about I I mean theater just makes better human beings because we have an opportunity to understand people from a much more intimate perspective and I feel like every single student would benefit from this type of you know human analyzation uh, analysis excuse me to um to get an idea of what it means to be human and why people do what they do and working with young artists, whether it's an actor or a, or a, um, a writer to really get to the heart of what they want to say, what they have to say and to help them find a voice to say that. And then for actors to understand that, you know, acting is a craft and it's not an accident. They're actually choices that we make and to watch them make that discovery that they are creating this character based on their choices and they have the power over what direction this is going to go. I find that really, really um, exciting. Well, and it translates so easily into real world skills, right? You have, yeah. you have the choice. Um, you have the, the ability to, to figure out how to work with others, you know? Yeah. Well, theater, theater makers are, are collaborators. They're critical thinkers. They're creative thinkers. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, and this is, uh, it leads again so nicely. You are reading my mind. Uh, <laughs> you're just like awesome with the segues, but, uh, we're here to talk about a very specific project that you're involved with. Um, and we're making sure we get this podcast out in a, in a really nice timely fashion because it's something that, um, our listeners can be involved with as well. Um, and that it really deals with all those wonderful skills, those collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, creative 
creativity skills all in one uh, really nice, tidy package. Um, so let's start by saying, uh, why don't you give a description of your festival? Yes, we have a festival. It's called the Red Eye Tens International Play Festival. Um, it began six years ago, kind of as a fluke. Uh, in my MFA program, I have my MFA through the Playwrights Lab at Hollins University, and the head of our department, um, Todd Ristow, was very, very adamant our first year about um, finding ways to produce each other's work, and uh, at whatever level each person could do it. And since I didn't have a theater company or a space, I was looking for something that I could do to serve the most playwrights in my program, but in a realistic fashion for me. And um, we have a festival here um, in the summer session that we do. It's called Overnight Sensations. And it actually is a, a genuine 24-hour play festival. They, um, they get prompts Friday night at 8, write the play overnight. The directors get the plays at 8 o'clock in the morning. The actors come at noon. And at 8 o'clock that night, there's productions of six new plays. So, um, so I talked to my colleagues and said, hey, you know, how cool would it be for us to do a 24-hour play festival, but in every time zone in the country? And they were like, that's crazy. And I said, hey, I know, but what do you think if we try it? And I found um, a colleague in each time zone, and we were like, let's give it a shot. And so we did. The first year, it actually was a 24-hour play festival, and that was insane because we had you know, four directors and one playwright, and they kept having to try to have um, discussions with their, with their directors, and it, was just, it ended up being too much. So the next year, we kept it within a 24-hour production time period, but we allowed 10-minute plays to be submitted. And it's found its way now into, we realize in our third year that it's the perfect vehicle for high schools and colleges because they have the infrastructure for the, for the festival. It requires six rehearsal spaces. It requires a team of, of people to feed the actors and directors and a space to perform in. And most high schools and colleges have a booster club and they have um, spaces for rehearsals in classrooms and then they have a theater space. So in our third year, we, we made it exclusively a festival for work for young actors and young audiences. Well, and I find more than any other group, if you, if you tell high school students you have 24 hours to go from audition to show, there will be a show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they love show. it. Yeah. They are so on board. They don't, you know, they're so much better sometimes, and I would even say most of the time, uh, than adults as far as not overthinking it. <laughs> no, well, it's yeah. because we know, right? We know about the, it's it's very fascinating because I think there's no other group it, right now that is so obsessed with failure and, 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 and that notion of can't failing. However, mm -hmm. they're also, they're also easier to jump on board the impossible, if that makes yeah. any sense. You know what it I mean? It does. Yeah. And in fact, we're at a point now where, um, you know, our, our guidelines for the playwrights is that they have between three and six characters because that gives us between 18 and 36 roles, um, which seemed manageable for most of our hosts. But we're finding in, in our California site that there's a lot of actors that want to get involved and we only have, you know, between 18 and 36 roles. And, and we probably could get twice as many kids on stage if we, if we had the, you know, capacity for that. But um, but they are super excited about it and they jump in for everything. If they don't get it, if they don't get to act in it, then they'll stage manage for us or they'll come do tech for us. So it's really exciting. Well, yeah, I was, that was exactly what I was going to say. Like, because it's a, it's such a time sensitive event, like it's not, um, it, you, it, the, the, the satisfaction of product is like immediate. Yeah. And everybody know. I mean, we're very transparent about it and every host site does it a little differently. Um, we have 10 hosts this year. So, and we have a couple new hosts, which is really exciting. Um, but each kind of each site figures out the way that works best for them. But in general, our, um, model is that on a Friday night, you get together for some kind of little reception and the, the roles are actually cast randomly. Oh so no, really? The names, yeah, the names are put in a hat. <laughs> And depending on how brave the site is, they can put all the names in one hat or they can separate them by gender. And the directors literally go around taking turns, just picking names out of the hat. So they don't know which, and they pick their play out of the hat. So they don't know which play they're going to get and they don't know who their cast is until they're done with that random selection. Well, that and that, again, perfect for high schools. Uh, no, one has to perform, no one has to perform an audition monologue. 
Yeah, exactly. And there's no favoritism. It's completely random and everybody gets to play. And if and you wanted to, I mean, just because, just because this is all I do is think about reflections in reverse <laughs> <laughs> and, and for our folks, but it's like, what an awesome, uh, to think to do at the end is to host one of these and just reflect again at the end about what, how is this process when you don't, when that control of, well, I'm going to pick my friends or I'm going to pick the, even picking the, what you think is the best person for the role when all of that is taken out and all you're doing is just figuring out how to work together and that whole critical thinking piece, how do we work together and how do we make this work? Yeah. And it takes a lot of pressure off too, because, um, you know, we tell the playwright straight up, this is a random selection process. So um, you may have an 80 year old man, if it's a community group playing a, a five year old one, a girl, who knows, you may have a, t- a 15 year old girl playing a 90 year old man. We don't, you know, it's just up to the luck of the draw. So that takes a lot of pressure off of production, like, like having a goal of a perfect production. And it really puts emphasis on exploration and experimentation. Well, I like um, that too. That's because that's something else I find that this this um, our, our group of youngsters in the 21st century is um, is really uh, onto that. How do we make things perfect? And it's like, well, what if you can't? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no pressure there. And and along the way, when the audience becomes involved and becomes that you know third part of the project, they're told straight up these plays were were received last night. They were worked on today, and now here they are. And most of them tend, and most of them are able to get off book, so it's actually a full production. Um, sometimes you'll have a complication, and then you may have someone with a script on stage. But most of the last few years, I think everyone's been off book. Uh, well, and I think that is the most exciting is when your audience, was your audience is on your side even before you start. Like mm-hmm. you, you just have the most. Uh, the experience just, it, go, it goes to a whole new level. I, I adore these kind of, I actually, I really, I love 24 hour play festivals or short play festivals or limits. Actually, it's limits that I think are so creatively satisfying when the world's not your oyster, but it's like, uh, th- th- these parameters are, are, have to be followed, right? Yeah, but you got to get it done. <laughs> That's ah. the whole goal. Everyone's just working to get it done, you know, which is really nice because they all—it's a teamwork. There's such a collaboration, and the the cool thing that has emerged with this with this international aspect because now we have a host in Germany and a host in Ireland joining us this year. Um, Germany we've had for a couple of years, but so we our first premiere starts nine hours ahead of everybody else. Um, and, and they, and they're texting each other. So all day, everybody from every side is tweeting and posting on Facebook and all those feeds go onto our website. So you can see what everybody's doing. They're doing pictures and little videos, little messages. And as each premiere kicks off the cast from the other host sites, send little video or audio messages to the cast that's just kicking off their premiere. And then starting in the United States, we have every hour a premiere until we hit the California, um, groups. And, uh, and it's just this huge, fun co- international collaboration within a 24 hour period. Well, and it's using social media at its absolute best, you know, yeah. like, like as, as a communicative tool um, and as a, and as a, as it's, it's, it, and a, well, it's a bonding tool, right? That, that it's everybody's, yeah. everybody's doing the, in, in this wonderful thing and that, how you know, if you're talking about comparing and contrasting too, like how does the, how does the, your, the host, uh, in Germany, um, interpret, uh, play a, how is a school in California interpreting host a, how is Ireland interpreting host or play? I'm getting it all mixed up, but you know, like just just the notion of interpretation, um, again, in a, uh, in a world where we're, we're, we're so focused on doing things just like they are on Broadway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is very grassroots and it's really amazing to see, you know, because it depends on your space. It depends on the the people you're working with and sort of the age range and your your culture as to how you're going to approach each of these plays. And for the playwrights, because the goal is, and I have to say, we've been having a little bit of a complication getting all the, the, the videos from our hosts to get them up. I'm hoping this year that we can get better about that. But the, the idea is that every host site uploads a video of the production. So the playwright has an opportunity to see their play done in, you know, eight or 10 different ways. I, that's so awesome. I just, I think what a great, um, a great sense of feedback that they can get 
and interpretation and all of that stuff. And I, and I want to make sure I mention this. I always uh, mention the show notes in the, in the intros and the extras, but I'm going to make sure I mention it here too, is that we have the, uh, the link for, um, for the festival in the show notes so that you can oh, uh, have a link yourself uh, for our Red Eye Tens International Play Festival so that you can go and have, um, no, we weren't, we're not going to have a link, Wendy Marie. We're just going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. no, so that uh, people can go and, and see for themselves and see if it's something that uh, that you can do. I just think this is I think this is an ideal um, school uh, project. I just think it's so uh, it's such a great uh, it's great it's quick um, it's a it's a great effect. Uh, I'm not gonna say great seven times. It's very effective. It is it's all these wonderful things, which is why I wanted to talk to you about it. Yeah, thank you. So tell me. So let's talk about just 24-hour play festivals. And what's your advice for those who, you know, if they want to be involved in this, in the Red Eye or they want to try and put it up themselves, what are some pieces of advice you would give hosts? Well, one of the things that I have learned over the last six years is um, organization is key. And I find that um, if you're working with partners who are off-site, then having templates to help them, uh, to help communicate the structure of the festival is really effective. We have um, a handbook of guidelines for our hosts and um, down to sample rehearsal schedules for the day. And I'm working right now on getting testimonials from each of the hosts and some tips on how they do their festival. So I think communication is key. Um, And also communicating within your own group and out to anybody who is who is responsible for helping make the event happen because it's a crazy day, but it's a wonderful day. And at the end of it, everybody's exhausted and happy. Um, if the communication is in line and there's not, and it's not, that's not overshadowed by frustration. So that, that would be the the key to me is, is keeping the, the organization and communication clear. Have you ever had issues come back where, this this scenario didn't work for hosts where they were like they were resistant to the uh the randomness or that there was an issue with the play like how are the plays chosen um i have a, a committee of readers from across from around the world actually of, of theater professionals um i always try to have a, a high um percentage of of people working in young adult theater uh and they're working artists um, directors actors and, and playwrights so they all read the plays and they score them. And then the math makes the decision in the end for which six plays will do. Oh, math. <laughs> oh, math. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, and, and, so that's cool. So that there are, so that these are, these are chosen um, um, independently. So have, yes. have there been issues and how did you deal with, with, with groups that struggle with this format? You know, I, I have to say, we haven't had any issues. We've had, um, I'm sure there are hosts that might not um, choose to do the random casting. Uh, we sort of leave it, that's our suggest- suggested model for the festival. But if they feel that they would like to cast it in another way, we're not going to stop them from doing that because we want each host site to have the most positive experience. Um, I, be- I don't think we have any sites that don't do the random casting, though. Everyone just kind of embraces it with this sort of, you know, um, adventurous spirit and i haven't had any complaints from playwrights which is what i was most concerned about yeah Uh, because you know some of the sites are amateur and they're going to do a very different level of work than somebody who has like even a really really um, well-defined theater program at a high school Uh, but i i've never had any complaints about that so i think we're really lucky well i think that i think that as with everything things when you know when you know what the scenario is up front it's mm. a lot harder to complain, you know, like, yeah. And for the playwrights, I mean, they're getting, you know, uh, anywhere from six, I think at one year we had six to 10 credits on their resume in one day. <laughs> Are you kidding? Or, oh, and yeah. from, like, I look at it and go, what a, what there's no, what a great way to see a whole bunch of different interpretations and figuring out how your work is. I'm already sitting here thinking, when's the deadline for next year? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no, we're open. We will let new hosts come on board as late as they feel comfortable doing it. Um, we, we do follow the dramatist guild bill of rights. So each of the host sites, it's made known to them that they are not to change the work of a playwright without the playwright's permission. Um, and we, we enforce that pretty strictly. Um, which I think is really important as a playwright. Uh, 
And we, we have had hosts that jump in like a week before and they're like, Hey, we want to try this. And we're like, sure, you know, get us your information. We'll get you up on the website and everyone can play. We try to send the scripts out to the host sites two weeks, at least two weeks before the festival casting. So they have a chance to decide who their directors are going to be because some, some host sites like our California host site, we bring in all guest directors from the community, a mix of professional and community directors to work with the students. But there are other host sites who like to have student directors. So it's up to them how they want to work that. That's awesome. And I know a question, I know a question that we need to uh, have addressed. Uh, when is the date for 2017? <laughs> what are we doing with this? Oh, yes, that is a, that is a good one. And uh, <laughs> it's also, I'm going to have to look at my calendar really quick. It's in September. Um, it's September 28th and 29th. So 28th being the night of reception, if they choose to do a reception, 29th being the actual festival. 8 p.m. on the 29th in your uh, in your respective um, time zone. So there is no, is there a limit to the number of hosts that you have? No, uh-huh. <laughs> there's no limit. I would love it if we had the hundred hosts. Yeah, there absolutely is, and there's no so there's no charge to the to the host, um, and and you can use it as a vehicle for um, fundraising. You can use it as a vehicle for friend raising if you want to do it for free. Um, the the playwrights. Um, are, are giving us the right to do their work for the festival um, free of charge and we have no submission fee. So it's really, it's, it's my way of trying to give back to the community um, of playwriting and theater and, and young actors. Um, so we, we would take as many hosts as we can get. Well, and also what a wonderful uh, experience, exploration experience where we're not worried about perfection. We're worried about uh, getting the job done. We're not worried about, um, uh, getting the perfect person for the role. We are just yep. going to take the role that comes to us and where we are working on being a collaborative group and a communicative group and a problem solving group. Well, yep. I, I just, and think, have fun. Yeah. Oh yes. Fun. <laughs> oh, fun. Uh, I think it would be so much fun. All right. So Wendy Marie, thank you so much for talking to me today. I have one last question for you since uh, sure. you are a, a wonderful playwright uh, and your play breathless is in our catalog. And I'm also going to make sure that we put Billy's play, um, a box of puppies, in yes. our uh, show notes as well, because everybody needs to go and um, read that. There's some just uh, his play, Huge Hands, is just I just think is marvelous. He is such a great playwright. I love him. Ah, we love him too. He's uh, <laughs> he's a uh, he's a he's a great friend of theater folk. Um, um but breathless. Uh, so yes. tell what is it about writing for youth that sparks you? I, I love the freedom in writing for youth. I, I love that the that young actors and young audiences just embrace magical realism and they embrace fantasy and they embrace breakouts from from moments of realism. Um, and there's not even a question about it. Like if you want a character to suddenly just fly, you can do that. And, and they're just going to accept it and get caught up in the magic of it. I think I enjoy writing for young young audiences more than any other you know, community of people. Oh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I also find that they are, there's no group that's more um, optimistic and enthusiastic about yeah. putting on a play. And it's like, why, why would I, you know, cause you know, people say, Oh, you know, writing for children. Why would you do that? It's like, why would I write for adults <laughs> sometimes? <Right. laughs> I know, seriously. You know, I, really the best audience. I, I had a, a colleague here who said, I'm not going to write for anyone but young adults anymore because they, they have the most enjoyment of, from my work. Yeah. And I think, uh, I actually think that it's the only audience where y- you can actually change a life with theater. Yeah. Whether it's someone who's in a play and they, they just, even the pure, the pureness of learning how to speak in front of an audience, like that can change somebody's life or yeah. someone sitting in an audience and going, I thought I was alone that I'm not alone. Yeah. And that was, that was a big core part of breathless for me was, yeah. was hitting those various audiences and saying, you know what, there's other people are dealing with these issues. Oh, I know. You know, I just, and it, it's a, it's a, those three girls, uh, the three leads in, in Breathless, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Breathless in the extra, but it, I just find they're just so, well, they're human and flawed and just, they, like, they're just, sh- they shine in their, in their flaws, you know, like they just, uh, it's a, it's a real great, 
showcase role, not for one, because that's sometimes what happens with, with plays, you know, it's that one lead girl. Uh, this one has three. Yeah. And that was my, my goal is to write material. My goal remains to be to write material for young women, um, to have a chance to embrace what it means to be a young woman and the challenges of that and the wonderful things to celebrate about being a young woman. Um, I don't think there can be too much work that explores that. No, no. And, uh, and I'll end on this. I, I really just speaking as a, as a woman playwright, I, I love that, that nobody cares about me being a woman in the high school market, right? They care about, are, is this going to be good for my students? Right? Yeah, exactly. It's very freeing. It's very freeing. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, let's make sure we end on, uh, the wonderful festival that Wendy Marie is piloting, not piloting. Yes. Piloting is the head of, uh, the red eye tens international play festival. Um, and you can find information on the show notes and you too can still participate. It goes September 29th and they take hosts. They, they want hundreds of hosts. So, uh, uh, you guys should all get involved. Okay. Thank you so much, Wendy Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy Marie. Okay, before we go, let's do some theater folk news. Any links to today's episode, including the Red Eye Play Festival, International Play Festival, and Wendy Marie's wonderful play in the TIFO catalog, Breathless, can be found in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 188. So let's talk about Breathless for a second. Uh, it is a relatively new play in our catalog, and it's it's just really great if you have uh, a trio of senior girls uh, who are looking for some really meaty parts. We have three girls named Summer, each of them in their own race for discovery. Summer Adams is looking for love in all the wrong places. Summer Robertson is hanging on through her battle with cancer. And Summer Davis refuses to lose, even at the expense of her body and her friends. If we just breathe, where will we go? Will we crash or will we fly? I love it. I love the description of this piece. It's a beautiful character piece, again, with three strong female leads. And you can read sample pages over on theaterfolk.com. Or, you know, we've got those handy-dandy show notes. Eh, you know, we keep making them. I'm, I'm sure people use them. Uh, but it's theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 188. And if you get that sample pages, you love the play, you decide I'm going to produce it, we want to know about it. We want to hear from you. We want to see a picture, uh, see some rehearsal footage. Give us 30 seconds. Uh, we want to brag about you because we are doing production features that showcase your success with Theater Folk Plays. And hey, even if you're having a struggle, we want to share that too. Everything is a story. Everything is a learning moment, right? Um, we want to hear about it. We want to see about it. We want to share it. Uh, so all you have to do is send it to us at tfolk at theaterfolk.com. We want to hear. All right. Finally, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk and on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to the Drama Teacher Podcast on iTunes. Just search for the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.